So what we're going to start looking at uh, is how a spit forms. What we need to do first is get our coastline in. So we've got a coastline like this. With quite a sudden change of direction in that maybe at a headland, which is really important when we start talking about how a spit forms. Now, uh, a spit is a landform deposition created by longshore drift. So for that, what we need is a prevailing wind direction that is coming onto the beach at an angle. So, like we have down here at the bottom, okay, the prevailing wind is coming in at an angle. Okay, and that's going to move sediment in that longshore drift zigzag pattern, swashed, remember, up the beach at an angle, backwashed down the beach vertically due to gravity, and so on. And sediment is going to be moving along that coastline in that direction. Now, I think in the exam, the easiest way to explain how to form is to use a diagram of annotations. However, we want to make sure we get that sequence formation. So what we want to do is actually is annotate our diagrams. We can put a number one down here, and then we can make sure we number our annotations so that it shows exactly what we want to be said in exactly the right order. So what we've got, okay, in this case here, is that longshore drift moves someone along the coast in the direction of the prevailing wind. Okay, and we can have that underneath our diagram if we want, or to the side. And as long as we've got the number in the right place there, then the examiner, whoever's reading our work, is going to be able to understand what we want to be read in what order. What's going to happen for a spit to form, as I said earlier, is that we need this coastline to suddenly change direction here at our headland. Um, and what longshore drift does, it actually continues in the original direction. It doesn't respond as quickly as you'd expect to the change in coastline direction. So sediment continues to be deposited across or out from the, uh, from the headland. Okay, so longshore drift will carry on in this direction here. Okay, again, what we can do is we can put a number two there. And then we can, again, do an annotation with that sequence. So when the coastline changes direction, i.e. a headland, uh, longshore drift continues to move into the bay in the original direction that it was moving in. And again, we can then move that off to the side and make sure we have that sequence. As longshore drift continues to move sediment uh, along the coastline that coastline's made that change in direction we're going to now be entering into the bay where we're going to have sheltered conditions okay you know, you know we associate bays with sheltered conditions low wave energy and therefore deposition starts to occur and that will start to build up a low-lying sand shingle and other uh, deposits and material uh, into like a ridge attached at one end to the headland Okay, and that will start to extend beyond the headland. Okay, and this is the beginning of our spit formation. You know, this bit of land here, as I said, is going to be pretty mobile. It's not going to be uh, particularly substantial, as I said, low lying, maybe maximum a metre or so above sea level and only a few metres wide. And that sediment will be being moved along by longshore drift along to the end of the spit, uh, meaning that this ridge grows out. So, again, what we can do is put number three there and then we can move in our annotation again. Okay, so as we've got here, in the sheltered conditions of the bay, longshore drift material begins to be deposited, creating a low ridge of sediment off the headland called a spit. And as I said, that spit will carry on growing as more and more sediment is moved by longshore drift across the coastline. What might happen is that in the bay, maybe due to wave refraction or just simply a different uh, wind direction, we may have a different wave direction coming in. And what that's going to do is it's going to cause the end of the spit as it forms to start curving round and curving inland. Okay, and we'll start seeing that as a you know, really characteristic shape of spits. They have this curved, uh, recurved end due to a different wind direction on the other side of the, of the headland. So again, what we can do is we can number that. We can put a four there, making sure I'm getting that sequence. The examiner is going to be left in no doubt that I want the first statement, number one, it's from down here two, three, four, and that's the order that I want them read in. Okay, so what we can put is, as the spit forms across the bay, the end may be curved around due to a new prevailing wind direction and or storm waves. So it's particularly if storms come in, they can have a significant impact causing the end of that spit to curve inland. Now, what we're then going to get in that area directly behind the, uh, behind the spit is a really sheltered environment. Okay, any waves coming in from here are going to be hitting the spit first. So therefore, this area directly behind is going to be uh, you know, really low energy. Okay, it kind of forms a natural harbour. That low energy means that we have a huge amount of deposition occurring behind the spit. Okay, and what we would expect to find in here is environments like salt marshes. Okay, caused by deposition of virtually all silt, mud, 
and other sediment linking. You know, these places only occur in really low energy environments. Again, we can number that, we put a five, and we can put our statement again. So behind the spit, conditions are very sheltered. In this low energy environment, high levels of deposition occur, creating a salt mass. You know, salt marshes may actually be submerged during periods of high tide or storm weather. Okay, so anything that's grown in there, any vegetation, has to be able to cope with that. Now, what would you expect to happen is for the spit to carry on forming? That longshore drift to continue moving sediment, keep on depositing it in the bay until it forms all the way across and joins up with the other headland. If it did so, we'd call it a bar. This forms in exactly the same way as a spit, but the difference between a spit and a bar is that a spit is only connected to the mainland at one end, so if you were to walk onto it from here, you'd have to turn around to come back off. A bar, you can walk all the way across and rejoin the land at the other end. Okay, um, normally behind bars, we also find something called a lagoon, which is a mixture of fresh and salt water, or in other words, a geographical term, brackish water. Sometimes spits can also develop into something that we call a tombolo, which is where it, mi uh, it joins up with an island in the bay, so you can walk from the... Uh, headland from the mainland across the uh, sand deposit onto an island. Now, as I said, you'd expect this deposition to keep going across the bay until you formed a bar. However, in a lot of cases, these bays will have rivers flowing out into them. And that river outflow is very important because as that any flow of water flows out of the river, it's got quite a strong current as it comes into the bay and it will wash sediment away and it will prevent the spit from forming all the way across. If that's not there, if we were to remove that, then the spit may get all the way across and form a, a bar. So again, we can put number six there, and again, we can have an annotation numbered to show the sequence. So we along these lines here. Okay, so the spit will form all the way across the bay and become a bar, unless a river is flowing out into the bay, transporting sediment out to sea and preventing the growth of the spit. What we then have is six, statements like I showed you earlier that very very clearly show the formation of spit step by step and it's that kind of ability to be able to to go kind of from stage one all the way through to stage six naming processes such as longshore drift, longshore drift and deposition prevailing wind direction using the key terminology uh, that shows the examiner that you really understand how these landforms are created. And I see no issue with using a diagram like we've just done there with annotations numbered to be able to show that because it seems a logical way to do it.